I'll look at the role Canadians can play when it comes to dealing with reproductive issues in third world countries. The emphasis both uh, on the part of the United Nations and by extension Canada has been to focus on birth control and measures to stem the spread of AIDS in places like Africa. However, the Catholic community is stressing a, a third option here, helping women in these starving nations to give birth to healthy children and protect their own well-being in the process. Joining me in the studio now is Simon Wally, project manager with Matter Care International. Simon, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, by the way, you are also the the son of the founder yes. of Matter Care, a fine gentleman. Tell us about this wonderful organization and your dad. How did you get started in this? Um, well, Medicare International is uh, an international organization of Catholic obstetricians, gynecologists, nurses, midwives um, that is dedicated to reducing maternal health care, uh, maternal deaths in developing countries. Um, my father asked me back in 1998 if uh, he had a one-year contract for public engagement, and uh, he couldn't get anybody to do the job. And you know, I'm, I've followed my father all my life, um, and he asked me if I wanted to take this position. And at the job, I, at the time, I had a job, and I declined it. And I said, "Thank you, but no, thank you." And uh, the following year, this contract would have uh, expired, and he asked me again, and I don't know what it was that day, but uh, I just said, yes, I'll do the job. Uh, I took the chance. It was a one-year contract, but 13 years later, here I am, still here. Yeah. Now, this uh, matter care has undertaken some major, major projects. For example, you've been very active in Kenya. We know that. Yes. Well, talk about that. Some of the, tell, talk about some of the work you're doing within Kenya. Um, what we're doing right now is we're trying to provide uh, rural essential obstetrics. And what that is is um, uh, we're providing emergency transport, emergency communication. Uh, we're training the traditional per, uh, birth attendants, and they're the ones that provide 87% of deliveries in villages. Now, are these akin to uh, what our... You know what? Um, what are they? What are they like? Are they trained medical people or um, no? Are they like a midwife? It's they're a little bit less than a midwife. They're right. usually the woman elder um, that have had the experience. They've gone it through themselves, um, and they usually handle most of the deliveries. Um, sometimes they run into complications, and they try to get the mother to the nearest nursing station. So if the nurse there can't handle the problem, then using emergency communication. Um, they'll call the local hospital, and they will send out the emergency transport. So in Kenya, we have a 4x4. Four four. Um, it's fully equipped. Usually it takes a nurse or a doctor, and that will be sent out to the, uh, uh, to the nursing station. And uh, this, this ambulance is fully equipped, um, and basically what you're doing is bringing the hospital to the mother. So when your time situation, uh, it speeds it up that you can bring all the care that the mother needs straight to her rather than waiting for them to come to the hospital. Does a woman living in, in a village in Kenya, for example, do they ever get to see a doctor during their pregnancy, or does a doctor not see them until when the big day arrives? Many times they will never see a doctor whatsoever. So that's where you have a maternal death, that uh, if, if they run into complications, um, that they'll never see a doctor. I mean, they're they're so far away. They don't have vehicles. The, you know, the roads are terrible. Um, where we work, um, there's a, a dispensary um, about 178 kilometers away. Um, they don't have a vehicle. Uh, it could take them days to, to get down there. So, you know, more than likely on the way, they'll run into problems, and they could end up dying just on the side of the road. I understand, too, that um, you're helping... Um, through Ma uh, Matter Care, you're helping fund a type of surgery that is not only life-saving, but that women uh, in some of these countries like Kenya can develop a problem whereby later on um, they can actually be ostracized by their own community. I mean, they're yes. they're they're seen on as uh, looked at as dirty, and they're and yeah, they're, they're, shunned they're sort by of their shunned own aside. Yeah. What's that all about? That's uh, what uh, it's maternal morbidity. That's obstetric fistula. And what happens is uh, when you have a, a woman that's malnourished or very young, um, or they, you know, if you have a breech birth here in Canada, you do a cesarean section. Right. Um, over there, what happens is the baby's trying to come down through uh, the pelvis, and what happens is they, uh, you know, this could be over several hours, several days, that they get a tear in the vagina or the rectum. So then they're incontinent of urine and feces. So unless it's uh, corrected by surgery, um, 
then they'll be you know, incontinent for the rest of their lives. So this was actually quite common in Canada and the United States uh, 100 years ago that uh, in New York they opened up a special hospital to, to repair this uh, in 1875. And then, of course, health care got better, uh, better nutrition, uh, that they end up closing this place in 1924. So today, uh, many doctors and nurses, they don't even know what it is. They're not trained here anymore for it. So if you have somebody interested in it, then many times you have to go to um, a, a developing country uh, specialized hospitals over there to learn to do the surgery. As a male, I'm not even going to pretend to imagine the pain that these poor women go through when this is happening. I mean, it must be terrible. Well, it is. We've met uh, several people that have this, and you know, they have to go around with a bowl between their legs or a rag or whatever they can find to absorb this. Um, We've met women there that have had this for 50 years, and, uh, you know, we just find it ridiculous that it's non-existent in, uh, you know, developed world, uh, develop, developed countries, um, but it's still happening over there. And, and the newborn baby in a situation, like I take it a lot of babies are lost, they don't survive Many babies, this. yes, where they're stuck in the birth canal that uh, obviously, um, you know, they're not coming through. Uh, they're not going to get a cesarean section, um, so the baby ends up dying. So sometimes a woman could be three or four days in labor that eventually the baby will be delivered, but it's already decomposing, and that's the only way it comes through. Whenever we hear programs like this, of course, the, the word sustainability comes in because this obviously must be very expensive to try to carry on these programs. Um, it's, it's not really expensive. Um, usually, uh, you know, the rough estimates is about three or four hundred dollars U.S. for a woman to have the corrective surgery. Um, the problem that they have in developing countries is that if you go to a regular hospital, um, Many times these cases are pushed aside. I mean, if you have a woman that smells or what have you, uh, they get pushed to the back. So uh, many countries, they have specialized hospitals to do that. Uh, there's one in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, and that opened up in, I think, 1975, and it's still going today. And it's actually a training center for doctors. Um, so then you have the cost there that you have to put up a building, and then, you know, you have to staff it. So uh, in the beginning, it's expensive, but in the long run, it, it's not a very expensive thing. But at the end of the day, you're helping a mother get her back her dignity. Absolutely. Um, help us understand this, because we know now that most, when we talk about reproductive issues and health issues in, in third world countries, Africa, um, what we usually hear is the, the position has been, well, we need to control the population growth. We need to do that. You know, I mean, they shouldn't be having babies because they can't feed and clothe the population they have in many respects. They simply don't have the infrastructure to look after the, their population. How do you juxtapose that against what Mattercare is doing, the approach that it's taking and saying, listen, you know, we're going to improve the lot of these of these people. They want to have their families. These babies have a right to be born. We don't have a right as a modern society in the West here to be dictating to people whether they're going to have children or not. And um, we can't sit back and close our eyes, I suppose, and just say, well, you know, uh, either abort them or use birth control. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to bother with this. How do you juxtapose the two? Well, where we are in Kenya, um Wealth is determined by the number of goats or camels or what have you. And they look well after as, their goats well, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it depends on droughts as well. <laughs> um, but it's also by family members. Yeah. And when uh, infant mortality is very high over there, many children die before the age of five. So, you know, they, they get malaria or any other disease. Um, so the more children they have more chance that the family is going to survive and you know when they need help uh, at home or help tending to the cattle and uh, you know you can always say that you know if in Canada if we had a population issue here that you know if the United States or France or somebody came to us and said we're going to control this um, you know control your population we'd say that's uh, ridiculous exactly we certainly would um, what about the age issue I mean has, has matter care l looked at this and run into this issue because we hear but certainly in Africa and third world countries, AIDS is out of control. It's horrifying. We have, we have so many little children who are orphaned because their parents both die of AIDS. H how is Mattercare approaching this? Um, well, we, we don't pr provide abortion or birth control over there. No. Um, but we don't turn them away that somebody who's had it and they've run into a, a complication or a problem. Um, 
Right now, the uh, Gates Foundation has come out with a program where they're uh, providing Depo-Provera, which is a birth control injection that's supposed to last for a few months. Um, there's a lot of issues there that uh, this drug um, uh, can cause problems down the road, like osteoporosis uh, increases the chance of breast cancer, cervical cancer, and sometimes um, you can have heavy bleeding. So when these women or the females run into this problem, uh, where are they going to go for care? So they could end up, you know, dying because of this. So, I mean, we try to educate uh, people as well while, while we're there. Uh, many times you go to a village and they, they don't know the difference. Um, providing condoms, uh, first they used to sell them over there, and if you're, you're paying 50 cents a shilling for a condom and that's what it costs to uh, provide meals that day, I mean, what are you going to do? And then, you know, you run into sanitary problems that, you know, they'll try to u reuse these condoms. So stuff like that uh, increases uh, the spread of AIDS or STDs. Yeah, in incredible. Simon Wally is with us, project manager with Matter Care International. We'll be back right after. <laughs> And we're back with uh, Simon Wally, project manager with Matter Care International. Uh, Simon, you're overseeing a project right now. You're building a hospital yes. in Kenya. Yes. Um, give us uh, some sense of the scope of this hospital and how is the project going so far? Um, well, we were asked back in 2005 uh, by the bishop over there uh, to go in and assess um, maternal health in his diocese. Um, he had a real problem. Um, over there, um, one in seven women will die. Um, will become a maternal death. One in seven. One in seven, where it's, you know, here in Canada. I mean, that's, that's the kind of numbers we hear, we may have been hearing th two or three hundred years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but we were asked to go into his diocese, and we said, yes, we can do a project here. And, uh, you know, we work in diocese because they've already got, you know, they started schools, they started hospitals, so they already have a system in place. And normally the church will provide 40% of health care in a developing country or in that area. Um, so we looked at it and we said, you know, well, we couldn't um, join on to the district hospital, that we had an independent hospital that would be self-sustainable. Um, so we built it in Niziolo, which is at the crossroads um, in Kenya. It's right in the middle. So if you want to go anywhere from Ethiopia, Sudan, or Somalia down south, you have to go through this town. So if you have refugees or, uh, you know, pastoralists coming, that's usually the region that they'll come through. So we said it was the best place to do the hospital. How difficult it has it been dealing with the political realities of the countries that you visit? We, I mean, we, we know Somalia, for example. We've heard all the stories about that. We hear the stories about the Congo and Africa. Uh, we're about to have some technical difficulties here as well. <laughs> but we... Okay. Are folks still hearing me, Jerry? Okay, because I can't... I've lost my headphones here. But we hear about all of the political unrest that's going on. Have you f had any difficulty through Matter Care getting the job you're trying to do done? Has, has there been political interference? In no, it's way? usually been pretty good. There's times where it can be viol very violent over there, um, especially during the elections like we, we saw the last election in Kenya. Um, where we are, there's a lot of tribal conflict uh, between various tribes, Tukana, uh, Samburu, Somali. Um, but that's usually off in the distance. Uh, you have problems with bandits. Uh, you have al-Shabaab or al-Qaeda that usually come down to this region to recruit Muslims to go back and fight um, in their countries. Um, we've been there where there's, you know, a gun battle down the road. Um, but generally, you know, this hospital, they, the whole community, they know it's not just for Catholic women. It takes any woman regardless of what their, their faith or their tribe is. So, um, you know, we, we've done this hospital that uh, it's acceptable to all the cultures. You know, when we had to do the washrooms, we had to make sure it's, you know, appropriate for Muslim women and, you know. Yeah, and do you find yourself having to walk a fine line as well and negotiate the cultural realities in some of these areas? I mean, where, you know, women don't hold equal status in many of these societies, do they? I mean, no. you don't want to be seen. You're not there to interfere or, in a sense, you're just there to make things better, but maybe we're, that we're can be there to help. I but mean, it, but it might be open yeah. to interpretation, right? Yeah, well, we, we built this hospital, and we do our projects, and we take in uh, all this uh, customs and everything into consideration. So we have uh, maternity waiting homes, which are outside, um, and that's acceptable to all cultures over there. 
um, you know, when we did, like I just said, the washrooms inside that we have to take in all local customs. Uh, and that's what we try to do, make sure it's acceptable to everybody over there. We talked uh, during one of our breaks, uh, and you talked about the... You, you termed it a culture shock when you arrived there, and you just returned not that long ago. Yeah. Um, tell us about what it is truly like. How did it hit you? Were you in any way prepared for what you encountered? No, when I you wasn't. First um, I've seen pictures, and you see how people are, but you know, you're kind of ignorant. To, you don't really think about it. And I started going to Africa in 2006. And, you know, it was, it was fine in the local town. It wasn't bad. People live in um, corrugated huts over there or buildings. Um, but then when you go out into the villages and you see the conditions that they're still living in, they have a hut and it's, uh, you know, made of stick and cow dung and, and mud put together. And, uh, you know, you just see the way that they live over there. Um, but it was amazing. Every time we went to these villages... Um, the kids would come running up to your car, and they're all smiling. And you see them, they're all happy there. And it's just, it's, you know, I know from my own kids that, you know, they have TV, Game Boy, and they have all these things. Over there, they have nothing, and but they're still happy. Is there, are they even aware of the outside world? Or are they more, are they more insulated to the point where they don't really I don't think in the villages the that they really know no. any different. Um, there's a lot of pastoralists over there, and they move around the countryside, um, you know, looking for grazing grounds where, you know, where there's a drought. And, and that's what they do all their lives. Um, you know, there, there are some people that you go to the main towns or what have you that uh, they have to go elsewhere to get further education, or, you know, if they go to a university or what have you. Um, some people get to experience going to other countries, and some of them like to stay in these countries. So um, in the villages that we go at, you know, obviously they don't know any different there. What about pastoral care? I mean, how is there, I mean, are they, are they open to Christianity? I mean, talk a bit about where, where, where they stand. Um, that's not my expertise. Um, but th many of them, they could be, uh, you know, intertribal, uh, and then you get conflict there. Um, many of them are either Christian or they're Catholic or they're Muslim. Um, I don't know where they, you know, they usually are there, yeah. but I know the church where we are, they have 12 dispensaries, and that's all around their district. So I'm sure the pastoralists will come along where there's people in that community, um, you know, the church does what it can do there. Um, I know that when you, um, and I did check out, uh, I did check out Matter Care, and you people are highly regarded uh, with what you do. And how, Now, what about fun? How can people help this cause? What can they do? Well, we've we've applied to various de development agencies or government agencies and foundations and the larger ones, and mostly they, you know, unless you provide, you know, the reproductive health or you know the abortion or birth control, you're not going to get funded. So we've had to uh, depend on general funding from uh, from general donors across Canada, the United States, uh, Austria, um, and then we've had a couple of smaller foundations that fund us as well. Uh, we also got funding from the Italian Bishops' Conference. So we've raised $1.2 million since 2006 to do this project. Um, but it's know, ongoing. It has to be ongoing. It has to, right? yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's six years to do this project and see where we are now, where, you know, it, it would make a difference if you got funding from one of these larger organizations or aid agencies that, you know, this could have been done six years ago and we could be further along or, you, you know, we could have been saving more women's lives during this time. So we need we need to wake the politicians up a little bit and realize there's there's another option here. There's more at stake. That's what we try to do. We, we go out to the communities, Abs and uh, that's what I'm doing yeah. up here now on the speaking tour. Um, and, and of course, there is skepticism within the public these days about various agencies, various aid agencies. You know, we hear this all the time. And I, I must say that Mattercare has an extremely uh, good reputation with the work you're doing. So. Uh, people don't have to be concerned about about that end of it. Um, do you are you launching any fundraising programs in the near future? What are you going to be doing? Um, well, I'm up here now. I'm doing a speaking tour, and usually that's uh, we find the best way of getting raising the awareness. Word out there, raising awareness, and you know, usually you'll uh, get donations. Um, from people that you're speaking with, and sometimes they'll remember throughout the year that, uh, uh, you know, instead of sending somebody a Christmas present, they'll send us a do donation instead. Uh, sometimes various communities or places that we go, they'll end up doing a fundraising event. Um, we also do mail outs. We have, you know, we have two or three thousand people on our mailing list that will send out three or four times a year an update of what we're doing. 
and then many of them uh, they just uh, send a donation along um, and then we just still we're, we're constantly applying to foundations and government aid agencies. So we're, you know we're doing what we can to get this done. To a Is there ever a recruitment drive? Are you bringing new people in to to go out and do the work that you do? Um, we always accept volunteers. Um, we had many speakers across Canada that. Uh, through the use of air miles, people donate air miles, um, and it allows us to send doctors to these countries, um, or we do training sessions. That we've we've had several of these in Trenton, Ontario, that we bring people from across Canada, and we'll train them what we're about, what projects we're doing, and then it makes it easier on us at the end of the day that. Um, if somebody's requesting in, in British Columbia, and they say that you know. Um, do you have a speaker in the area? So we say, yes, we do, and they'll go up and they'll do the speaking rather than us. Well, it's wonderful work you're doing. There is a website for Matter Care, yes. too, right? Okay. Um, do you have the address for that? www.mattercare.org. Mattercare.org. Matter is one, one T, yes. right? Yes, M-A-T-E-R-C-A-R-E dot O-R-G. Simon Wally, Project Manager with Matter Care International. Pleasure meeting you, Simon. Thank you very much Thanks for Thanks for me. the work you're doing, by the way. Thank you. Yeah.